Hey guys, let's talk about books. Now today, let's continue our tour of my non-fiction bookshelves. We are up to the 300s of the Dewey Decimal System, which is social sciences. They are here on my shelf. Social sciences covers things like, I think, politics and law, customs, etiquette, even folklore. And although I don't have heaps in this section, I've got enough to talk about. You can find the rest of this playlist. I will link it in the cards and also down below. And let's do it. Let's talk about books. I'm excited. I love talking about my nonfiction babies. All right, I have a gap on my shelves. I have a giant pile next to me. First one is Judith M. Bennett and Ruth Mazur Karras as editors of the Oxford Handbook of Women and Gender in Medieval Europe. This was published in 2013. The call number is 305.409, which is a history of women. Uh, this is a collection of academic essays about if you can guess, women and gender in medieval Europe. I think predominantly England. Let me have a look at the contents. Oh no, we've got like Jewish communities, Byzantine. Oh yeah. So the parts they've broken this up to is gendered thinking. So thinking about what gender as we perceive it means when we apply that term to early medieval. Is this early medieval? In medieval time. Uh, Law, domestic lives, land, labor, and economy, bodies, pleasures, desires, engendering Christian holiness, and turning points and places. <laughs> Let's move on, otherwise, I'll be here all day. If you are interested in the academic study of medieval women, Judith M. Bennett is a fantastic name to look for, and Ruth Mazakaris works a lot in uh, historical Jewish women Jewish research. In the discipline of history you often get books and articles written just by one person and of course they're writing in their research area so unlike sciences where you can have like 20 to 50 names on a paper. My cat's just getting comfy over there. In the humanities you'll have one or two names and so if you're researching a particular area and you find somebody is writing in that area you can track down their work rather than look for like a topic or a keyword. Move on, move on. We'll, we'll be here all day. Next we have Mary C. Erla and Marianne Kowaleski. Kowaleski, Gendering the Master Narrative, Women and Power in the Middle Ages. Again, this is an edited collection of academic essays. This was published in 2003 and the call number is 305.409, History of Women. Uh, what's in this one? I don't think I've really looked in this one much. Women and power through the family, women and confession, hey geography and women's history, women in the late medieval English parish. That sounds interesting. I'm going to bookmark that for later. Where's my bookmarks? <laughs> Coming back to you. All right. Penguin Classics. I certainly haven't read this. Patricia Skinner and Elizabeth Van Hout's Medieval Writings on Secular Women from 2008. Call number here is three. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's in transparent. <laughs> I can't read it. It's 305.409 History of Women. What does this say? This remarkable collection brings together a host of writings from across different regions and cultures of the Middle Ages from the 9th to the 15th century. They are arranged to follow the life stages of a medieval woman living a secular existence from infancy and girlhood through marriage and motherhood to widowhood and old age. Secular is basically you outside of the church, which all women would have been except for nuns. Oh, it's, it's translated sources. Oh, that's cool. I probably have used this one in an essay or three then. From 1938, we have Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own and Three Guineas. That's that's the receipt coming out of there. Uh, the call model. Oh, what's that? More receipt. The call number here is 305.42, which is Role of Women in Society. A Room of One's Own and Three Guineas are two separate non-fiction works essays i think you are right there papa get comfortable in your beanbag i've kept the receipt in here because i bought it from the national library of australia because my husband took me on a date there he's met me before <laughs> 
And I am intending to read at least a room of one's own. We shall see. This one is Writing Medieval Women's Lives from 2012, edited by Charlotte Newman Goldie and Amy Livingston. Call number here is 305.4209, which is the history of women in society. Oh god, I can't read that. I'm sure I have this because it was in a palgrave sale. Not that I have looked into it at all. Well-behaved women can make history. Women's friendships in late medieval Westminster caught my eye. And it's the same author as the one before that I just bookmarked, Catherine L. French. Uh, are we sensing a theme? This sounds, oh, it sounds good. One day I will get to these books, maybe, maybe. From 1999, this is Miri Rubin's Gentile Tales, the narrative assault on late medieval Jews. If you're familiar with Jewish history, Jews in predominantly Christian areas, they're um, often accused of murdering children or doing other horrific things as an excuse to then exterminate or expel Jews in a particular area as a literal scapegoat. Call number here is three is really long. 305.89240902, which is Jews in Europe in the 14th and 15th centuries. Drawing on a range of sources, Mary Rubin explores the frightening power of one of the most persistent anti-Jewish stories of the Middle Ages and the violence it bred. Um, this particular story is was Jews were accused of abusing Christ by desecrating the Eucharist. None of it's ever proven, but that's not the point. The point is the story. This one is a classic if you study sociology or religion. This is Emile Durkheim, The Elementary Forms of Religious Life. It's translated from French. Uh, it was really originally published in 1912. The call number here is 306.6, which is Religious Experience and Practice. I've read bits and pieces of this one. Couldn't tell you anything concrete about it except that everything that I've written on religion is based on this book. <laughs> like this is always referenced at least once as a foundation theory even if you then go on to disprove the theory or take another angle. This is always like a foundation. This and freaking Foucault who I don't own. Again in the 306.6 Religious Experience and Practice, this is Lived Religion, Faith and Practice in Everyday Life by Meredith B. Maguire. I feel like this was a textbook. It's got a dead spider on the top. Was this a textbook or was it I'm interested in lived religion and that's why I bought it. It's making that noise. Like I have never flicked through this before. Well, uh, I guess it sounded good when I bought it. This one came out in 2008. And maybe, maybe one day, I will sit down and do a non-fiction TBR challenge. This is lovely, this one. Uh, this is a revised edition of In the Midst of Life, The Australian Response to Death. This is by Graham N. Griffin and Des Tobin. The call number here is 306.6, no, 306.9, which is the sociology of death. This is fascinating in, okay, well, you have to be into death for a start in the way that uh, Australians in particular, our death and grief culture, the way that we uh, treat the dead and the dying, the way that we form our cemeteries and conduct funeral rites and uh, incorporate grief into our everyday existence or how we don't do that. And because Australian history, Australian white history is relatively short, this goes from Victorian time through to, I want to say the 90s. This, <laughs> I'm going to rant here for a bit. Things like the way that cemeteries looked for like big um, monuments and big concrete tombs through to crematoriums that have just like little plaques and lawn cemeteries where you just can look over a peaceful calm field and not not be uh, have your view intruded upon by headstones and the reminder of dead people you just have like a, a a calm calming natural visage that's that's what this book tackles i love it if you can get your hands on a copy from the library and you're interested in death culture i highly recommend so there's that <laughs> 
Yeah, they were all from the top level 300 category, which is just social science. There is 310, which is statistics. I'm not into statistics. We don't do numbers in this house, and so I have no statistics books. But I do have, surprisingly, 320s, which is political science. This one is <coughs> not mine. <laughs> That's why it's in my collection. Uh, this is inherited from my cousin's collection after he passed away. This is F.L. Ganshoff's Feudalism. This came out in 1964, and I reckon it will be clearly dated. Uh, the first French edition, oh, it's translated. Uh, the first French edition was published in Belgium in 1944, so it's going to be dated, but also... Uh, there's no reason not to have it in my collection. So this is 321.3, which is feudalism. This has been generally accepted by scholars as one of the most lucid and penetrating studies yet written of one of the most basic institutions of European civilization. Feudalism. Okay. Um, so even though it's dated, there's nothing wrong with an older book when we're talking about the academic history and I'll probably have a flick through one day. This one is mine. Uh, this is Bartolome de la Casas, a short account of the destruction of the Incas. This is a primary source that was written in 1552 by a priest, a monk, um, la, 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 la. priest, a Dominican priest who obviously went to Mesoamerica and saw firsthand the atrocities perpetuated by the Spanish. Call number here is 323.11, which is the history of civil and political rights in South America. I did a subject on <laughs> Europe and the New World, which was mainly Spain and the New World, and this was obviously a useful primary source. This book has been out of print for so long. Uh, this is My Wife, My Daughter and Poor Mary Ann by Beverly Kingston from 1975. Beverly Kingston is one of the wave of 70s Australian feminist writers with uh, the only other name I can think of off the top of my head is Shemaine Greer. My Wife, My Daughter and Poor Mary Ann tells of the movement of women into the workforce from the 1860s to the 1930s when paid employment at last became respectable for unmarried women. The factory, school, hospital or office was often prefer preferable to life at home in spite of long hours and appalling conditions. But what of the women who did not work? Beverly Kingston has used diaries, letters, newspapers and women's magazines to reveal the unenviable lot of those who rocked the cradles of the developing Australian nature, nation. The coming of gas and electricity merely served to bind women more firmly to the home where they became the minders of machines and small children in the millions of unsupervised factories throughout towns and cities in which any kind of slavery, slavery was condoned in the name of comfort and good living. If you think about how we got to stereotypical 1950s housewives, this is what Beverly Kingston is railing against in this book. And the call number for that one was 331.4, which is the labour economics of women. Um, we're in the 330s now, which is economics. But that's all I have because oh, economics. 340 is law. And I have one law book, which might surprise you. I don't know if I've talked about this before. It is E.P. Evans, The Criminal Prosecution and Capital Punishment of Animals from 1906. The call number here is 344.049 which is miscellaneous social problems and services in European law. This one tackles the phenomena in Europe in mainly early modern, there's a timeline here in the back, medieval and early modern, trying to apply our laws of society to animals. Things like locusts, pigs, bears, wolves. Why would you apply the law to animals? Well, have they ruined your stuff and you need to have somebody to blame so that you can get compensation? We've got here moles, locusts, serpents, mice, caterpillars, flies, horseflies, eels, pigs, bulls, Spanish flies, an ox, lots of pigs. Like when pigs get out, they eat stuff, they wreck stuff and pigs are big. I don't know if, you, if you've not seen a pig in person before. They are massive and they can destroy stuff. I have this 
because I was, my honours was about, in England, people, usually women, who were accused of being witches had familiars, which were animal personifications of the devil or a demon. And why weren't they taken to court over the things that they did when animals all over Europe were being taken to court? Why weren't familiars also prosecuted or any attempt at prosecution of familiars? I do have an answer, but it's because of Protestantism. 350 is public administration. I have nothing under there. Uh, focuses on the theory and practice of public administration, government policies, and public organizations. That sounds tedious. 360, oh, I have a problem with this. 360 is social problems and services, which examines social issues, social problems, social services, various organizations and associations working in social welfare. Now, I have this book because my friend wrote it. In 2008, it was a different time. This comes under diseases of the digestive system. And you will see when I tell you what the book is, why I have trouble with this. But I searched and searched and there was literally nowhere else in the Dewey Decimal classification where this would sit. Uh, this is The Amazing Adventures of Diet Girl by Shauna Reed. It's basically from the time when blogs were published in, in books and sold to the masses. And this is Shauna's blog of her weight loss journey and coming to a better mental health place. I have it because she's my friend. But yeah, I would not buy a weight loss memoir normally. And um, I hate that it's shelved in diseases of the digestive system. We move on. 370 is education. And I have how to be a study ninja. Study smarter, focus better, achieve more by Graham Alcott. The call number here is 371.30281, which is Methods of Study in Education. This came out in 2017. Highly recommend, if you're in the, in the market for a productivity book, uh, this one was great and applicable not just to study, although obviously that helps, but also just generally, you've got something that needs to be done, you've got a certain time frame. What, how do you sit down and plan it all out to get your shit done? I found it useful, I found it interesting, and I can implement some of these strategies for my child who's going to her final years of secondary education. This one I have because it was a uni textbook. This is the Study Skills Handbook 2nd Edition from 2003 by Stella Cottrell. Uh, the call number here is 378.17, Methods of Instruction and Study in Higher Education. I have no memory of this place. What have we got? Preparing for uni, identifying your skills, working with others, <laughs> research skills, writing for uni, blah, blah, critical thinking, revision and exams. Clearly this was a first year subject or even a pathway subject. To get into uni, I did what they called pathways where you do little hand-holding subjects because you're a mature age student and you didn't get the good marks in your year 12 which i highly recommend you do it was actually awesome but i reckon that this is what that came from was just hand holding into uni as with this one sue drew and rosie bingham the guide to learning and study skills for higher education and at work this is from 2010 and the call number here again 378.17 methods of instruction and study in higher education this one's heavier and weightier and what does it have to tell us? Writing essays and dissertations, writing reports, producing portfolios and journals, including blogs, giving a presentation, succeeding with exams, blah, 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 blah. I have no memory of this place either. Oh no, it looks a bit familiar. If you're assigned to the textbook, you have to get the textbook. 380 is commerce, communications, and transportation, which is, is nothing that I have. 390, I have a few books here. This is Customs, Etiquette, and Folklore. Starting with Gina L. Greco and Christine M. Rose. This is The Good Wife's Guide, a medieval household book. Uh, Le Manchier de Paris is, oh, how do I explain this? Household books were generally written by men 
for men to explain what they should be looking for in a wife and what their wife should be doing in a home. This is a translation from a French one. It's got an introductory essay and that sort of thing. And then the actual text has things like um, on chastity, devotion to your husband, the care of the husband's person, the husband's secrets. But this one in particular is an awesome source to to be extant today because it has recipes in it. It's really uncommon for us to have historical recipes because if you know how to cook a thing, why would you write it down? It's something you cook every day. There's literally no reason to have it written down. And so we just don't have these sources. And some of the, the ingredients listed in these recipes, we don't know what they are. We can guess based on context, but we don't know what animal it's referring to, for example. So that's cool. Let's look at some of these recipes. What sounds good? Here we go. Roasted meat. Fresh beef tongue must be boiled, skinned, larded, roasted, and eaten with cameline sauce. Know that the tongue of old beef cattle is better than that of young ones, or so some say. Others say the opposite. When the weather begins to get cold, the people of Gascony buy tongues, boil and skin them, then salt them one on top of the other in a salting tub and leave them eight days. Then they hang them in the chimney all winter and in the summer higher where it is dry. In this way, they will keep well for 10 years. They can be cooked in water or wine if you wish and eaten with mustard. Oh, that one translation was published in 2009 and the call number on that is 392.3, which is family and home relations. Then I've got some folk tale stuff. This is 398.2 folk literature. Uh, folk Tales and Fables of the World by Barbara Hayes. This is my copy from 1987 <laughs> or thereabouts. Hang on, let's check. Which is when it was first published. This one, 1987. What have we got here? Things like Beowulf, The Green Children, The Lorelei, How Finn Found Bran, and some Aesop's Fables. It's basically a big children's book. There are illustrations. And it's grouped up into cultural areas. Oh, it smells like an old book. Oh, I love it. Basilisks and Beowulf, Monsters in the Anglo-Saxon World. This is published in 2021 by Tim Flight. The call number here is 398.2425, which is Animals of Legend. Who were the Anglo-Saxons? Who were the monsters they're talking about? What are dragons? Etc. And finally, for my 300 category, we have Richard Firth Green, Elf Queens and Holy Friars, Fairy Beliefs and the Medieval Church. The call number here is 398.45, which is Paranormal Beings of Human and Semi-Human Form. It's really quite specific, isn't it? Can you guys see the cover there? It's quite interesting with the emaciated, almost skeleton attacking people. And this lady covered in fur except for her boobs. Hmm. I haven't actually read this book, but I was doing work on the concept of fairies for that honors project I was doing about familiars because what is the difference between a demonic familiar and a supernatural or preternatural fairy? Mm. That's my 300 collection. Not heaps there compared to the 100s and the 200s. I think it's respectable. And of course, I'm always looking to grow my nonfiction shelves because I just love them so much. They really are my pride and joy. Thanks for hanging out with me. And I've linked this playlist below and in the cards. I will see you guys next time. Bye.